There's no shortcuts. You, you want to develop your craft, it takes time. You want to discipline yourself so that your talent can be used, it takes time. I think I just learnt that very early on, as a kid really, that you can't do anything in a short period of time. This is the Hillsong Creative Podcast, where we hear from creative experts, influencers, dreamers, and doers, what they've learned and what we can learn from their journey as we explore, respond, and create. Hey guys, it's Rich Langton here and welcome to another episode of the Hillsong Creative Podcast. I'm so glad that you've joined us uh, for the episode. It's a really good one and it's one I'm excited uh, for you to hear. But before we get into today's interview, let me remind you that we're just one month out from our worship and creative conference. The team is madly preparing for you to come and be a part of the conference. Last year's conference was unbelievable. We really met with God and He really did something special and I'm believing along with the team here that He will do something special again. So um, if you're coming, be prayerful and be getting prepared. But if you're not coming yet, I would, I would strongly encourage you to think about coming. It's in Sydney, Australia. Australia, and it's just in four weeks time. If you want more information about that, you can go to hillsong.com forward slash WCC. On today's episode, we have Pastor Gary Clark. And uh, if you know him, you will love him. He's the lead pastor of Hillsong Church in the UK. This interview is one that I did with him back at Hillsong Conference. And we talked about all sorts of great things, mainly about, about church in the Dominion Theatre in downtown London, and really about the way he approaches the team of creatives that he has there, his mindset around building a church and really outworking a vision. And um, and I guess the, the juxtaposition of, of um, what it means to be a creative who is a professional, works in a career outside the church and also a volunteer in the church and how he sees that and how they approach that and really I guess how we approach that as Hillsong Church. So I'm excited for you to hear this interview. It was one I did with Pastor Gary Clark. So we'll jump straight into it and I'll talk to you afterwards. So Gary, thank you so much for coming and being a part of the Hillsong Creative Podcast. I've been wanting to ask you questions about the way you see creativity and church for a long time because I've visited the Dominion uh, over the years. I've visited it and I see it's it's thought through. There's somebody, i.e. you, who obviously has an eye and an ear for the detail of the way it feels, the way it looks, and I'm presuming it's you. Would yeah. you say that's true? Yeah, I would think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> So for the people who haven't, wouldn't know your backstory, you were born in the UK? No, no, I'm for, I was born in uh, country Victoria. Right. And we're a part of Hillsong in Sydney then? Hillsong, I was here in Hillsong in Sydney for four years. Yeah. Then we, uh, we got the chance to move to, to England and um, sort of take the, extend the vision of Hillsong Church into right. England and Europe. It was only four years in Sydney. Yeah, well, it was four years that I was actually a part of the church. Right. It might, might sound strange, but it was always the church I'd go to, but I couldn't because I was, I was in another church as a church leader. Right. <laughs> but but it, was, um, it just always captivated for me how I thought, you know what, I, I just like, I like the way Brian thinks. I like mm. the way he sees things, like the way the church is. Mm. Uh, very different then to how it is now, but mm. but then it was very contemporary, and I'd like to think now it's still very contemporary. Yeah. So you had known the church, and then um, became a pastor in Sydney. Did that for a little bit, and as you said, the opportunity arose. When you got there, did you know what you were wanting to build? Could you see it already? Yeah. What was that? Describe that. Well, I, I saw it as, as as a church that you would say, a church that would be relevant to the context of the city that it existed in. Right. Often people say to me, you know, why are the things that you do at the Dominion like they are? And I say, well, kumbaya and acoustic guitar in a West End theatre, working West End theatre that has a show that's happening six days a week, I'm not sure that would really work. Right. So you turn up and there's a small team, a small group of people, you could see something. How did you go from that then to what's there now? 
Um, I tried to sort of in the early days sort of say to everybody, you know, you know, well, let's let's do this in a way that if if TV cameras had to turn up yeah. and film what we do mm. and put it on TV and we would capture people's interest, mm. let's do it like that mm. in anticipation of it being seen. So yeah. it's almost like it, it's do, do it so if, it, if it's observed by outsiders, mm. there's something about it that would cause them to consider what it was about. Mm. Was that an easy process? I think it was easy for me. I'm not sure it was easy for my team. Um, a lot of them will still say they thought I was crazy. Uh-huh. Um, some of them, I think, still say I'm crazy. <laughs> but um, no, I could see it clearly in my head. Mm. Couldn't say exactly a certain thing, but just the concept of this is contemporary. I didn't want it to be cutting edge. Yeah. And I didn't want it to be trailing edge. I wanted it to be relevant to the now and just had a picture in my head what that what I thought that was mm. and kept wanting to just build the church in that way, in a way that, I don't know, you know, it, I think sometimes as Christians we're afraid of our senses. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, you know, God gave us senses for a reason. Mm. And, um, and and so I wanted to be something that, that was visually stimulating, mm. God-honouring. Mm. Um, I wanted to, I, I wanted the, I wanted to, fi- you know, you feel something. I wanted you to be able to see something. I wanted mm. you to be able to hear something. Mm. I, I just wanted it to be something that just brought everything alive as best as you could. Mm. That was my, that was the thinking behind it. Right. And so then, as you're building the church in that picture, you're obviously attracting musicians and singers and dancers and, I guess, a whole scope of uh, the arts. How did you know what to do with them? Well, you know, the West End's an arty part of London. Right. It's not just the theatre district. Your London is that way mm. to a degree. And, um, it, you know, I set, I set very high for myself, mm-hmm. set very high standards of what I expected with what we had. Mm. So if we only had a handful of musicians, I wanted them to, to set a benchmark that, set a high standard that said um, if I was a good musician and I came into this church, mm. would I want to be a part of that team, yes or no? Mm. Um, if the answer was no, why? Mm-hmm. I sort of set a standard based on that. Mm. It's just not, it's not a have a go show. We want to, mm. you know, I always say, you know, excellence honours what it represents and inspires others to do the same. Yeah. How do you, well, how do you approach someone who is a professional creative out there uh, and when they come into church and they're, they're giving of their, I guess, their professional life, but they're now doing it in a sense for free, um, how do you approach that conversation and do you have to? Don't even have it. I just, I, well, because it's, it's a, a the, the conversation doesn't happen. Hmm. Um because you've created an environment of of volunteering or of giving of yeah themselves. and using your what can you bring to the table for our expression as best we can to represent Jesus we all bring something to the table mm. how do you bring that to it this is your thing that you're a part of to um to represent Jesus and and a lot of them especially a lot of the dancers some of the dancers who gets get saved mm. are through guys and girls in dance teams mm. who um, talk about their church, right. invite their friends to church. Invariably, they invite their friends to the things that they do in church. Mm. So some of the things that we do that maybe we get criticised for, I don't know, they're the credibility that they can say, hey, come and have a look at what we're doing at church. Mm. And it usually just, yeah. just blows their friends away and somehow their friends end up in it and a part of it and... Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing that I, one of the things that I tried to do is, as well is, is separate, you know, the, for, for some reason in church life we're afraid of the word performance. Mm. And so it's all, and the, the, you know, the two, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be we have people who are into performance and people who are into, into worship. worship. Well, it's a completely different craft. Right. Um, you know, Leading people in congregational singing mm. 
is, uh, is different to singing a song to people. Mm. And the funny thing is we say that's leading worship and that's performance. Well, both are performance because mm. p- all performances is using whether it be innate talent, we love to call it gifting, but it's usually innate talent, mm. that um, we use that and we as a craft mm. to, to achieve something. Well, mm-hmm. that's what performance is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some, we love to blend it together and I try and encourage our guys that, no, it's different. Mm. It's not. The, it's not the same. It's not the same thing. Mm. And try and give the, you know, call it the performer type people, chance for their expression, mm. um, and give the people who are worship type people chance for their expression. Yeah, it's great. And therefore, there's room for more people to bring what they can bring. Do you find that? Yeah. Mm. And and there's certainly more room for people. Mm. Um, now, whether we've got enough or not is always the challenge, but it, it validates the who they who they are. You mm. get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I do. Look, I was just thinking, you know, the girl, that, one of the girls I said that, you know, she does her, in a couple of things we do, she's a performer mm. and she'll do, I think she does, what is it, Oh Holy Night or something at, at a carol sing at Wembley and the whole place you've got, I mean, the presence of God is... Mm. Thick, yeah, and it's straight out performance. Uh-huh. Do you think, from that perspective, then they're they're kind of doing the same thing? As in, the the aim is to point people to Jesus. Um, one though is, um, I guess, sing with me. The other is watch me sing. But both are saying, uh, essentially, look up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, from that perspective, are you very aware of what it's like for the congregation person? It's the only person I think of. Right. And is that, I was going to ask a question about Wembley and the Christmas um, spectacular and also your Easter, the rock opera, when you're planning to do those things, is it because you, you're thinking of that congregation member who can bring their friend? Totally. It's all, we've, carols is, yes, it's our church gets together, mm. um, but carols is that one of those things that people in our church can easily say, do you want to come to church today? Mm. And then they say, but it's at Wembley Arena. That's a whole nother that's a whole nother leverage to ask someone to church today. Right. Because um, in the UK or in London that would be just mind blowing for people. Oh, I think Wembley Arena is a pretty big arena. I think it's mind blowing for anyone. Um Right. You know, it is. But, yeah. but, but for but for people to think, you mean there's that many people turn up to church mm. in one service? Yeah. And then they'll go, Yeah, but there's three of them, so which one do you want to come to? And, and it's just leverage for people in our church to bring their friends. Mm. Um, Easter is um, the whole production is so people can bring their friends mm. to, um, to church at Easter. And when I'm thinking of friends, I'm not thinking of Christian friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not thinking of people who have a Christian heritage. I'm thinking about people who know nothing mm. about the gospel mm. being invited to something. Mm-hmm. So I try and make it as, how do you say, as contemporary and seeker-friendly as you possibly can but ram Jesus straight down their throat. (laughs) Where does the idea come from? So a rock opera. The rock opera was really all based on... um, I went and saw Jesus Christ Superstar when I was a kid. Never understood a bit of it Mm. until one day somebody said... Do you know Jesus Christ Superstar is the story of Jesus through the eyes of Judas? Hmm. I thought, ah, oh, now it makes sense. Right. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but then that sparked a train of thought for me. And I thought, what if we did something that was um, telling the story of Jesus through the eyes of hmm. somebody else? Hmm. So, so the rock opera is the story of Jesus being told through the eyes of Peter, mm-hmm. um, through Mary Magdalene. So similar concept. Mm. They're telling their story and experience of Jesus mm. through the eyes of um, these people. And then when you think about who those people were, sort of Peter was, you know, you're the Christ. He gets this revelation of who Jesus mm. is through the eyes of Judas. He he just thought he was a man. You know, he's a man. He's a businessman. What mm. is he? Mm. Um, through the eyes of um, Pilate, for example, in... Um, 
Mm-hmm. In the Easter one, it's all written. The, Jesus through the eyes of the centurion mm. who was at the cross, mm. he went, surely this must have been the Son of God. Mm. Pilate who was conflicted. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's tell the story of Jesus through their eyes, mm. which that identifies with people in the audience because mm. they're really sure if this be true, surely right. I'm conflicted. Mm. So you're straight away identifying with the friend that someone has brought to church. Yeah. As I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking you're the senior leader, you know, lead pastor for London and broader, do a lot of, I guess, pastoring of our team globally. And and it seems to me that you want to do that as creatively as possible or use whatever you can to do that. Yeah, well, yeah, because I think, you know, everybody says the arts influence and shape culture. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if we want to influence and shape culture... We better use the arts. Yeah. Would you call yourself creative? Yep. I think I think the problem, problem with the word creative is if the, the singers and the guitar players have hijacked the word and made it their own. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get right back to the episode, brought to you by our Hillsong Worship and Creative Conference, which happens in Sydney, Australia, every November. Come be a part of everything happening on site, like the exclusive collabs with practical training from our key Hillsong team. The conference has limited spaces, so if you can't make it to Sydney this year, why not join the online conference experience so you don't miss a moment of the main sessions? Find out more details at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. Now, let's get back to the episode. I'm Gary Clark, and this is my fantastic four. My favourite way to recharge is if I get a chance, I love to go skiing. Oh, the last book I read was, um, I can't remember the exact title, but it was something selfie. Essentially, it was all about how culture has developed this whole obsession with self. Job I'd be terrible at would be childcare. Oh, I love kids, but I mostly love my own. One person I'd like to have coffee with and why? Sir Alex Ferguson, most successful football manager in Premier League history. So when it comes to uh, speaking and preaching, how do you approach that? Because your, your uh, if, if I could put it this way, your style is, is um, one person described it, I was just chatting with someone a minute ago, they described it as sort of circular. You have an, a concept really that, you, that you're trying to convey and you circle around the concept and then, and then hone in on it at some point. Yeah. Is that intentional? Um. I don't try to do that. Right. I don't even know if I'm any good at it. Um, it's just the only way I know what to, how to do. I tried the other way, you know, three points, an introduction, three points, an illustration, an application. It just confused me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought all I want to do is take this and help someone understand it. Mm. And so if I can just so break down preconceived ideas... So some of the stuff I might talk about doesn't even doesn't even seeming like it relates, uh-huh. but I'm trying just breaking down, mm. just breaking down preconceived ideas, mm. breaking down perhaps belief systems, mm-hmm. and just keep breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down until they go, ah, I see what you're talking about, mm. and hopefully what I'm trying to get across is sort of mind blowingly simple in concept, right. but you only get it if you break down. Mm. all the things that are cluttering mm. your perspective on that. Yeah. Has it taken you a long time to get used to the fact that that's your style? Yeah, because it's not really validated. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? It's like a, it's not not many people, I guess, speak like it. Mm. And um, it's not your typical church, church preacher, mm. church teacher. Mm-hmm. So I just... It took me a long time to just accept it. Oh, well, it's who I am. I've just got to live with it. Hmm. I have so many more questions, but I feel like we should probably wrap it up just to respect your time. Um, if you had to encourage the listeners, the creatives who are listening, what would you say to them with their relationship to church, with their probably their creativity is not validated either, like you were talking about just a second ago? What? How would you encourage them? What? What? What should they do? I would say you've got to 
you got to own who you are, mm-hmm. which I think for a lot of creative arty people, um, there's always a, a little conflict with the who I am and who I think I'm supposed to be, who I'm trying to be. There's something true about you just have to find yourself, mm. um, understand yourself. It's mm. a little bit like, you know, we're talking about the, the, the opener for conference. Mm-hmm. Like I just know what in that, my part I played in that, I know what I can do mm-hmm. and I know what I can't do. Mm-hmm. So I know where I need others and I know what I can do myself. And because I'm now, I guess, a bit older or whatever, I just go, I know what I'm I know what I can do and I know what I can't do. Mm. I think when you find yourself, you get yourself in that place. Mm-hmm. And then, the, so you, that's your own personal journey. Mm. And I, I think putting yourself in an environment, mm. uh, if we're not careful, we, we call that our journey, where I'm going from one environment to another environment or I'm going to move from this and move to that mm. and I'm moving on, it's a new season. Hmm. Um, you know, I use the term sometimes, artists and creatives are good at the seasonal callings of God. There's no such thing, I okay. might add. Um, right. it, explain uh, that a little bit. Well, it's for this season, I feel like God's called me to this. Right. But now it's the end of that season, He's mm-hmm. going to call me into another season. Mm-hmm. It's pr- it sounds, well, artists love saying it because mm-hmm. it sounds so, it just sounds so wonderful. Right. But it's, there's no, nowhere in the Bible that validates it. Mm. Um, so I think that the personal journey is in the finding of yourself. Mm. That's the journey. Mm. But the how is that going to be expressed? It's only going to be expressed in the context that you're prepared to actually put yourself in and do the hard work in. Mm. And um, if you don't put your don't put the hard work in your context. So mm. that's you know for us we're talking about churches and things like that. You've got to do the hard work in your church. Mm-hmm. And commit yourself to the fact that, um, you know, I often say, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built. <laughs> um, and you commit yourself to the long, longevity and journey aren't the same thing, <laughs> right? So you've got to commit yourself to the longe- longevity mm. of mm. being a part of something mm. and allow, as you discover yourself, allow that to come out and others recognise it. Mm. You know, sometimes I've, when people say, you know, you know, people just aren't recognising my talent, and I say there might be a reason for that. There's maybe a talent they have recognised it and it's not good enough yet, so maybe you've got to develop it. Right. Um, so, so that's where the personal journey comes in. Mm. If you can't s- settle in yourself, you can't settle in a place. If you don't settle in a place, then you're just going to be wandering around mm. forever chasing this inevitable mm. place to be accepted and given a place to express yourself. Mm. So good. I don't know how that sounds, but anyway. It sounds great. I think it's an encouragement because um, I guess I, I'm uh, chatting with lots of artists all the time and they do say things like what you're saying, oh, this season is taking me this way or that way. And um, it probably comes out of that not sorting stuff out on the inside. And in, in who you are mm-hmm. and, and just learning how to, how to settle. Yeah. Uh, last question. For you, has that been a has that been something that you learnt easily? Um, yeah, well, I think that the put yourself in something and commit yourself to something. Yeah, um, I probably learnt because I'm a I used to be a, used to train horses. Mm-hmm. You know, whether I was any good or not, it's not really the question. But I, um, you can't train a horse. There's no shortcuts to training a horse. Mm. Um, well, you can, but then the end result is no good. So there's no there's no shortcuts. Mm-hmm. You you want to create you want to train an animal. That it takes time. Mm-hmm. You want to develop your you want to develop your craft. It takes time. Mm-hmm. You want to um, you want to discipline yourself so that your talent can be used. It takes time. Mm-hmm. And so I think I just learnt that very early on mm-hmm. as a kid, really, mm-hmm. that you can't do anything in a short period of time. Mm-hmm. And to frustration is not is not the thing that you use to say I think God's changed His mind about where I am. It might be God speaking to me about what I need to change, mm. and maybe what I need to change is internal, not mm. circumstantial. Yeah, fantastic. Well, until next time, thank you so much for coming on the Hillsong Creative Podcast. Thanks, Rich. I think it's been an encouragement, and I think people, um, I think it'll actually stir people to consider the inside journey um, 
because uh, it's obviously a thing that we all need to work on and make sure we have right foundationally. So, so thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was a fun interview. I always enjoy talking to Pastor Gary Clark. I love the way he thinks and his, um, his pace of communication. It allows me time to think uh, about what he's saying and really take it in. And I think there's a lot for us all to learn from what he's saying there, particularly about the, the inner journey uh, as a creative of allowing time and space to deal with the stuff that's going on in the inside. Particularly one thing he, he mentioned about uh, changing something on the inside rather than changing our circumstances. And as creatives, I know it's so easy to want to jump ship when things get tough or to not want to stay the path and just stick around long enough to see results and yet what Pastor Gary is encouraging us is exactly the opposite is to be planted and really work on ourselves work on our craft and trust God that eventually we'll see the results so I hope you've enjoyed that and I hope it's been a challenge and that you take on board um, that way of thinking that we should stick around and uh, go for the long term not just the short term results Next up, we've got this week's story for the Psalms of Ascent. And you can find out more at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. And don't forget to join us in the 100 Day Creative Challenge. I came to Hillsong College in 2004. I'm from America and um, moved to Sydney, Australia, came to college and I just knew from day one, this is where I needed to be. We went on a journey that was over 10 years long of 22 visa applications, um, lots of disappointment of failed visa sponsorships and things like that to try and stay in Australia. I think the psalmist in 130 just made it so clear and so simple. I wait for the Lord. I put my hope in His Word. I'm not putting my hope in my circumstances. I'm not putting my hope in my clever ingenuity. I'm actually waiting on God and I'm putting my hope in His Word. I'm hoping in a person, not in an event. I think oftentimes we think hope looks like excitement. I actually think hope is more of a quiet confidence and waiting. Everything circumstantially doesn't give me cause for excitement, but I'm looking beyond the circumstances. I'm looking beyond the how and looking to the who. And that's my anchor. Well, that's it for today's episode. I really hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that pretty much anywhere you get podcasts. That's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even YouTube. We'd also like to hear from you too. So if you have a comment, you can do that on our Instagram, which is at HillsongWCC, and we'll see you next time.